Hello everybody, and welcome to a new series called Learning Optimal Control with Dymos. My name is John Yasa, and if you're familiar with my practical MDO series, this will be very like that. However, instead of using OpenMDO, we will be focused on learning optimal control using Dymos. Dymos is an open source tool made to help us solve optimal control problems within the OpenMDO framework. Dymos is useful for a variety of applications from spacecraft to aircraft to anything that you would want to simulate as a dynamical system. This series will be relatively informal. I hope to just go through some of the documentation of Dymos, kind of talk through it, and present the information in a little bit differently digestible way. If you're somebody who likes learning from videos, these might be great for you. If you'd rather just read the documentation and not listen to me, that's A-OK -okay too. So let's first jump in with one of the most simple examples in Dymos, the Berchristochrone problem. This problem is all about finding the path that minimizes the time to go from a point A and B. You might have seen this on shows like Mythbusters. We got Three, this Vsauce two, guy here too. One, the idea go. is to make the ramp that allows these things to go from point A to point B as fast as possible. Let's start talking about the actual Berchristochrone doc page, and I'll go through this. Now, I did not write this doc page. Rob Falk did, and Rob did a great job. He says things you'll learn in this example, and he shows you what we're going to go through. This is the most simple. It's the first example. So here we're talking about defining a Dymos ODE system or ordinary differential equation system how to test the partials, how to add a trajectory object, and actually solve for the optimal trajectory to go from point A to point B in this case. You could have read Bernoulli's original work in 1696 where he was talking about how to go from point A to point B in the shortest possible time. We have a beautiful graph here. Let's talk about it. So if we're going from point A to point B, and we want a little bead that is frictionless to just go there as fast as possible, you might think, oh, a straight line is the shortest. I like this. It's got to be the shortest path. Is it the fastest? I don't know. We'll find out. Again, this bead is only being acted upon by gravity. The control that we have in this case is basically where we bend the wire to make this happen. We could have a straight line. We could have a very bendy wire. This example shows some of the, the forces that are acting on it. We have the force of gravity right here. Then we also have V, which is not a force in this case. It's the velocity, but it's showing the velocity of the, the little point as it goes from A to B. Now, this is all well and good. I've only talked about kind of the physical meaning of the system, though. I haven't talked about how we would define it in Dymos. Let's go into a bit more detail about that. We'll start talking about terms like states and controls. So state variables in this case means anything that we're tracking the current value of. State variables here would be X and Y, the horizontal and vertical positions of the point, as well as V, the speed of the particle at an instant in time. We need these states because we're trying to track them as we go through time. As we move from point A to B, time is progressing as well. We need to know what the values of these X and Y and V states are. We're going back to a little bit of undergrad differential equations here. Let's talk about the system dynamics. So if we look at how these states are defined, X, Y, and V, we need to know how they change with respect to time. You might see this written out as X dot or DX DT, for example. The X position changes based on velocity as well as the angle of theta. I did not drill into this, but let's go back up here. Theta is defined as the angle between the vertical gravity vector and the current angle of the wire. So if we had just a straight line from A to B, theta would never change. It'd be a fixed value. But in this kind of curved example, we have theta changing. It gets bigger and bigger as it becomes less like the vertical gravity vector. Okay, so that's what theta is. Theta is a control in this case. We'll get to that in just a second. But first, let's talk about how to get x, y, and v dot in more detail. It's the velocity magnitude times the component that's moving in the x direction. That makes sense. For dy, dt, or y dot, it's the velocity again, but it's moving in the downward direction. So it's anything to do with cosine of theta, and it's in the negative direction as well. Now, dv, dt, or v dot, is just g cosine theta because it's the force of gravity that's causing the particle to accelerate. Okay, now I told you that this series is called Learning Optimal Control. Where do the controls come into play? Well, in this case, we have one control variable. So it's the angle between the gravity vector and the tangent line of the curve. What I mean by this again, and I'm just reiterating this, is that if we have a, a little wire here and we're bending it, theta is essentially saying where it is being bent to, what direction it's being bent in. We're going to allow Dymos, in this case, the optimizer, to control theta in time. Now let's talk about the initial and final conditions. So the initial conditions basically say we're at zero comma 10, we're not moving. The end point is at 10 comma 5, and velocity can be anything at once. It could slam into point B, it could stop exactly at point B. We're not dictating anything about the velocity. This isn't the most exciting, right? We're just setting initial and final conditions, but we have to lay this out so we can tell the problem what to do. There are going to be a few key steps to defining this ODE as an OpenMDO system. If you're already familiar with the OpenMDO framework, we will follow the exact same procedures that you would for setting up a component. 
This would be the initialize, setup, compute, and compute partials methods that we would need to define. However, if you're unfamiliar with OpenMDL, let me take a little bit of time to explain what each of these do. You can think of initialize and setup as sort of telling OpenMDO what sort of problem you're solving, which inputs and outputs there are, how big they are, things like that. Compute is where we actually do the computations, in this case for the ODE, to compute x, y, and v dot. What I mean by this are that these are the rates with respect to time for each of our states. And then compute partials computes the derivatives of any of the outputs in compute with respect to the inputs in compute. It might be easier for me to show you an example, so let's scroll on down and take a look. So here we instantiate a Berkristochrone ODE as an explicit component. This is a normal kind of simple system in OpenMDO. We first initialize it and say, hey, here's the number of nodes we have or the number of points in time that we are discretizing this problem. And then we also have static gravity. This is unimportant for this example, but just know that it means gravity is the same at every point in time. For spacecraft applications, that might not be true, it might be different, but we're not doing that right now. Let's talk about this. We have inputs and outputs here. Our inputs are velocity, gravity, and theta, so that angle for the wire, and the outputs are x, y, and v dot, and a check. We can check the solution here by using this check. Again, v is a state, that's something we're tracking, and it's an input here. This might be a little bit counterintuitive. Without going into too much detail about the co-location methods, the optimizer takes an educated guess at the state values over time, and then uses the line fit through these values to have an approximation of the state rates. We then compare the state rate values from this approximation with the computed state rates from the ODE, and the optimizer converges this until that difference is essentially zero. This ensures that the optimized values actually represent the physics of the ODE. So similarly, theta is a control. The optimizer controls the value of theta and passes it into the ODE. All the ODE is doing is calculating the physics, in this case, x, y, and v dot. Again, this part is really just telling OpenMDO, hey, this is the ODE that I have, and these are the, the inputs and outputs that I care about, and we know what they are based on how we define our states and controls. We then move on to declare some partials, which just means that we know that x dot depends on v, x dot depends on theta, uh, when we define our compute partials later on, we'll need to have these declare partial statements done. If you're unfamiliar with this, I highly recommend checking out the OpenMDO side of things to see what the documentation is for how to declare these partials. Now, we have a compute statement. This compute statement is relatively straightforward. Again, the actual underlying physics of this problem is just a bead that's frictionless with gravity acting on it. Relatively straightforward. We're fortunate for that. This is the first example. So for v dot, we have that g times cosine theta, x dot has v times sine theta, and y dot has negative v times cosine theta. None of this should be earth shattering, it should not be groundbreaking, I showed you this before in LaTeX, and now I'm showing you it here in Python. That's all we're doing. The compute partials here computes the partial derivatives for each of these state rates. Again, with respect to v, a state, theta, a control, and g, a static force due to gravity. Now let's delve into this a little bit. Rob did a great job of outlining some important points here. He notes that there are no inputs for the position states x and y. That's because the dynamics don't care about x and y, they only care about v, the current velocity. Additionally, g is an input, gravity is the same throughout, we don't need derivatives with respect to gravity because in this case it's not changing. Again, if you have a spacecraft, maybe it's changing, but in this case it's not. And then I briefly mentioned this, but check, don't even worry about it, check just lets us take a look at the trajectory and make sure that everything is going as we expect. In this case we know the optimal solution, so we can uh, check that, hence why it's called check. Now let's test the ODE. You do need to check your ODE to make sure all your partial derivatives are correct. If they're not, when you hand this off to the optimizer, it's not really going to know what to do. So this next code block here is simply instantiating the Berkristochrone ODE and connecting up a few variables so that it's easy to, to perform this check partials. We use the complex step or CS method to check the partials and it's checking all of our declared analytic partial derivatives against a complex step or an approximation of it. The neat part about complex step is even though it's quote unquote an approximation, it's very accurate. Okay, we're taking a look here. Everything's basically machine precision. I feel good about these derivatives. I'm not stressing about these. Now, let's delve into the fun part, right? Here we're actually going to solve this optimal control problem using Dymos. In this case, we'll use the Legendre gas lobato co-location method. This is different than the idea of explicit shooting where you have a point here and you move forward in time and move forward in time. The co-location method, without getting too much into the details, essentially fits a curve through time and space to compute these states and state rates. As we receive information from the system about the state rates, this curve's derivatives are checked against those rates and either confirmed to be good or bad. If they're bad, then the optimizer kind of moves these states and other controls around until feasibility is reached. Again, that's a gross oversimplification of what's going on. If you want to learn more about it, I highly recommend going to the Dymo stock pages that explain more about the co-location schemes. I'll have a link in the description about those. 
For now, let's focus on the actual code here. So we first start by instantiating an OpenMDO problem and declaring a driver on it. This simply means, hey, we have a problem and we want to optimize it. We then add a trajectory. You can think of a trajectory just as a container for phases. Now we have a phase. We add a phase here and we say, please use the Brachistochrone ODE that we just defined for this phase. Additionally, we have a transcription here, which is just how we define to Dimos what time looks like, how to actually instantiate this ODE. Again, we're using the Gauss-Lobato co-location scheme, so we simply say, hey, the transcription here has 10 Gauss-Lobato segments. Again, I don't want to go into too much detail about this, but just know that it tells Dimos how many points to make in time. Now, this is the fun bit. We get to set time options and add states. So first, we have fix initial equals true, which means we're not moving the initial point in time. We're starting at zero time. Kind of makes sense. We're allowing time to go between 0.5 and 10 seconds. So between points A and B, we don't know how long it's going to take. It might take 0.5 seconds. It might take 10 seconds. It could take anything in between there. We're allowing the optimizer to control the time as part of the problem. Then we have three add state calls. Now this is fun. We have X and Y positions. Fix initial is true for both of those and fix final is true. Now for V, remember, we do not care about the final velocity but we know that we're starting with the particle not moving. So fix initial is true, fix final, false. It can be anything, it can be anything at once. Next up, we add a control, theta. Again, this is the angle between the wire and the force of gravity. Then we add the force of gravity. You might've guessed that was coming up. What's our objective? Our goal is to find the fastest way to go from points A to B. Again, we have a point on a line, it's frictionless, it's moving between points A and B. We're trying to minimize the amount of time it takes to do so. So our objective here in the DIMO sense, in the optimization sense is time. We're not trying to minimize the wire distance. We're not trying to maximize the speed of the particle at point B. We're trying to minimize the time for it. Then we have a linear solver, which means that we simply ask the problem to solve for the derivatives using this type of solver. Don't think too hard about it. Next up, we set up the problem, which to OpenMDO just means, hey, get everything ready, instantiate some vectors. We're about to solve this problem. Then we have some initial conditions. So our first idea is that maybe it will take two seconds to go from points A to B. We don't know, but the duration for this first phase we're guessing is two seconds. Additionally, for each of the states, we have some guesses. From X, it goes from zero to 10. Y, it goes 10 to five. Now in this case, that's not really a guess because we're fixing the initial and fixing the final. It's more than a guess. It's prescribing, hey, at the beginning point, it's here. At the final point, it's here. For V, we have an initial guess from zero to 9.9. Maybe it's going to be going that fast later, but we want to start out the problem relatively close to where the optimal solution will be. Lastly, we have theta here. Theta is this control. We don't really know what shape it should be. Should it be a straight line? Should it be a little bit bendy? Should it have some wiggles? Uh, for now, we just say theta goes from five to about a hundred degrees and it will be changing linearly. Now we actually run the problem. Isn't that fun? So you call dimos.run problem and it solves for the optimal trajectory. The output here is shown below. We have some information about how OpenMDO is setting up the derivatives and solving for them. That's not the most important part. We then see the optimization terminated successfully. Isn't that beautiful? Come on, 24 iterations, it's all done. Found a good time. The optimal trajectory takes 1.8 seconds. That's not too bad. Let's plot that. Let's take a look at what's going on. We have a little bit of code here to plot out some time series information. And let's just scroll down and take a look. So this top plot here shows the X and Y position. You can see it starts at 0 comma 10 and ends up at 10 comma 5. And then this shows the theta in degrees, the control, with respect to time. So we see that the optimal theta increases linearly. And this is the optimal curve for getting there the fastest. This is kind of fun to think about, right? It's definitely not a straight line. It doesn't have some of those wiggles that I showed you. It does go down at first a lot to build up speed. This makes sense to get that particle going fast. And then it actually dips down a little bit below five here. And it does start slowing down before it gets to point B, but it gets to point B the fastest. I like that. So, so far we've set up a Bacristochrone ODE, told Dimos how to solve it using a co-location scheme, and then actually solved it and plotted the results. The optimal solution may not be that intuitive, but with a little bit of thought, it kind of makes sense. You build up speed, it gets the particle going faster, you dip slightly below, and then we end up at 10 comma five. That's pretty cool. Let's move on a little bit and talk about the idea of also solving this using explicit shooting. So single shooting in Dimos or explicit shooting is a way of saying, I'm at this point in time and I want to go to this next point in time. Boop, 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 boop. It just kind of plots it out. Because we are computing the rates of the states, X dot, Y dot, and V dot, you're able to start at a certain point, compute those rates, and then move forward in time 
explicitly shooting, to get to the next point in time. This is maybe one of the most simplistic ways to integrate a set of states. It's not necessarily the best for some optimal control problems because you could pass everything up to the top level optimizer and solve everything all at once. That's pretty slick. But let's go into detail about this single shooting method. So here we do a lot of the same thing. We define a problem. We add a trajectory here. We have a grid for this. Again, it's going to be the Gauss Lobato grid. We're going to use the same kind of points in space. But now we're saying the transcription is explicit shooting. So just like I was saying, we have points in time and we're moving forward in time based on the state rates that we compute. Here we have fixed initial true for all of these, but we can't have fixed final because we don't know what that final is. We have not shot through time yet. So we cannot say fixed final is true in this case. Again, we're trying to minimize time here. Everything else remains the same. Now we need to add these boundary constraints for X and Y. Again, because we could not say fixed final is true, we have to say, hey, at the final point, make sure that X is 10 and Y is five. That's relatively straightforward. We're constraining this at the optimization level. And so what this means is that the optimizer will say, we took the trajectory, we shot it, and this isn't ending at 10 comma five. We need to change the trajectory to meet these constraints. Again, we have some initial guesses, this time at just the initial points in time, not for the entire phase, because again, we're just shooting through this. Now let's run the problem, let's see what's going on. Again, some output from the optimizer. Oop, optimization terminated successfully, I love that. We can plot it again, it took 1.8 seconds again. The particle moves from point A to point B in 1.8 seconds again, that's pretty good consistency. Let's take a look at the results here. Okay, again, the curve looks very, very similar. It's got points here, it's doing what it's doing. The optimal theta is maybe just a little bit wiggly at the beginning, but it looks the same throughout. You know, it's essentially the same trend going from zero to a hundred something degrees. Beautiful, beautiful. So everybody, this was the Berchrista Crone example. Big word, fun example, very digestible. Again, this is the first in a series of videos about optimal control. We'll be using Dimos to kind of showcase its capabilities, explain what you can do with it and how you can do it. And also just provide a different way for you to learn. Maybe you like reading doc pages, maybe you like seeing videos. Let me know if this was helpful to you in the comments. Let me know if you'd like to see our particular example worked through next. Everybody, thank you for your time. Guys, gals, and non-binary pals, I'll see you later. Bye.